Do you think you have a fixed mindset or do you think you have a growth mindset? With the fixed mindset, things are just the way they are. We are powerless to change them. With the growth mindset, we have the ability to improve anything. We'll continue becoming limitless together. If you want to see other parts of this book, go to the link in my description on YouTube. It's going to be a fast reading, but if you want to take notes, if you have a notebook near you, I highly recommend that you take some notes. Taking notes is one of the best ways to remember information. We're on chapter six, the seven lies of learning. What are the most limiting myths that you tell yourself? Myth, something that's not real, like a mythical story. How can you overcome the debilitating effect of, the, of these myths? And how can you turn these limiting beliefs into positive one? You're being lied to. They are lying to you constantly. And sometimes by yourself. We are all subject to an endless stream of misinformation about our constraints to our abilities. And we receive this information so often that most of us have no other choice than to believe it. The problem is that these messages directly oppose your quest to become limitless, your quest to become successful in life. These limited ideas uh, entertained in our mind can stall us or steer us in the direction that we don't want. So let's bring seven to light. Let's talk about seven of them. Examine them for what they are and replace them with something better. Lies that you tell yourself or lies that other people tell you about yourself. The first one is what? Intelligence is fixed. On the surface, it looked like Ray was a pretty positive person. She ran her own business. She had a thriving social network, and she loved being around people with big ideas who could imagine possibilities that most of us wouldn't dream of. When Ray had a daughter, she realized that perhaps she wasn't as positive as she thought it, she was. A different kind of mindset started to show up in very subtle ways, as these things do. Subtle, subtle. The B is silent. The B is silent. So we say subtle. In very subtle ways. Subtle is, it's hard to explain this word, but it means indirect. Like if something is subtle, it's not very, very obvious, but you can, you can tell. First, it was in the way she reacted to some of the things her little girl did. Ray tended to think that that's just the way she is. Instead of believing that she could have an effect on the way her daughter believed, uh, her daughter behaved. When her partner tried to teach their daughter new things, Ray noticed she felt a subtle discomfort. Here we go, that word again, subtle discomfort, feeling uncomfortable, you know, as if she wanted to protect her daughter from disappointment if she wasn't able to learn what she was being taught. She became aware of the constant thought that her daughter was too young to learn that. Too young to learn that. One day, her partner looked at her and said, do you think she can't learn? That she's never going to improve from where she is? The answer was, of course not. 
She loved her daughter, and the little girl was bright and curious and learning something new every day. The opposite was obviously true, and yet Ray was aware that there was some belief buried deep inside her that whispered, "No, she's she's the way she is." You know, a lot of times parents do this with their kids. They just try to say, "Oh yeah, no, she's just a shy person, or she's just the way she is." Ray was struggling with a fixed mindset about her daughter's intelligence. You see, there are two types of mindset: fixed, fixed mindset, and growth mindset. Do you guys know the difference? Fixed mindset and growth mindset. Fixed mindset is very hard to change. In life, in general, in business, personally, like if you think you're not good enough, and you have a fixed mindset, no one can change your mind, or you'll be very hard. But a growth mindset is a type of mindset where,、uh, even if you make mistakes, even you are not good enough, you can say, "No, it's okay. I will continue trying, and I will learn." Growth mindset, fixed mindset. These beliefs are incredibly subtle. Few of us consciously think about our restrictions or the restrictions we believe others have. But it leaks out. It comes out. It comes out in places that deeply affect our happiness, our emotions, in work. Or home life, or and with our children. If we believe that it's not possible to improve, then in reality it will not be possible to improve. It's extremely difficult to accomplish something when you don't believe it can be done in the first place. Right? When you don't believe. Something it something can be done in the first place. It's going to be very very difficult to accomplish that, to、uh, pursue that goal. Carol Dweck, a professor of psychology at Stanford University, describes the difference between a fixed and growth and a growth mindset. A fixed and a growth mindset. I was just talking about that, right? In a fixed mindset, students believe their basic abilities, their intelligence, their talents are just fixed traits. You know, like a lot of people say, "Oh yeah, my parents were like this," or, or I grew up in this kind of environment, so I'm just gonna be this kind of person. That is called fixed mindset. They have a certain amount, and that's that. And then their goal becomes to look smart all the time and never look dumb. In a growth mindset, students understand that their talents and abilities can be developed through effort, through good teaching, and persistence. They don't necessarily think everyone is the same or anyone can be Einstein. But they believe everyone can get smarter if they work at it. Once you change your mindset, then everything will change. Like Ray, just like Ray, most of us don't think about whether we have a fixed or a growth mindset. Most of us have carried on thinking in the same patterns that our family did. Without even knowing it, as subtle as this is, the adoption of one or the other deeply affects the way we approach life, the way we live our life. This part is really important. The adoption of one or the other—that means believing you have a fixed mindset or believing you cannot change, believing that change is possible, like following one of the other. Will affect the way you live your life. 
So now my question to you guys is, do you think you have a fixed mindset or do you think you have a growth mindset? Do you think if you work hard, you can change your life completely? Or do you think you're just stuck where you are because of your current situation or your family condition or, or your country situation? Which one? I think most of you being interested in this, you have a growth mindset because you're interested in learning. And that is the most beautiful thing. With the fixed mindset, things are just the way they are. We are powerless to change them. With the growth mindset, we have the ability to improve anything. If Ray thinks, even on a very subtle level, that her daughter can't improve or grow, what does she do instead of teaching her? Probably a number of things. Placating, giving timeouts, diverting attention. All of those work to alleviate the stress of the moment, to lessen or to make the stress easier, alleviate. But they don't contribute to her child's growth. In the same way, if as adults we believe that we don't have the capacity to learn, what do we do instead of taking the responsibility to teach ourselves what we want or need to know? There are so many people that I know who believe, like they really believe. They say, yeah, like learning a language is not for me. It's fixed. There's no way you can change their mind. It's a very, very dangerous way of thinking. We tell ourselves it isn't necessary to make excuses. Sorry, we tell ourselves it isn't necessary. We make excuses. We blame other people or circumstances and then distract ourselves with things that make us feel good. Bro, if you become comfortable with feeling bored, you will become unstoppable, you will become limitless. The genesis of this limiting belief is likely one that you either don't remember or that came from your early years, early years when you were a child. And it has a deep effect on the way you view intelligence and your capacity to learn. IQ scores and testing were created in the early 1900s to better assess which students would experience the most difficulty in school. French psychologist Alfred Binet and his student Theodor Simon were some of the first scientists to come up with a test that measured intelligence after they were commissioned to do so for the French government. They were able to devise a test that took into consideration age as it related to competency. They were also lauded for the fact that the test was easily adaptable to other languages and cultures. More than 100 years later, lauded, they were lauded for the fact. They were also lauded for the fact that the test was easily adaptable to other languages and cultures. More than 100 years later, it's still hotly debated whether these tests have the ability to measure intelligence, which is the ability to acquire and assimilate knowledge and information. Interestingly, Bennett himself was not happy with the way his test was used. He was not happy how his test was used because it didn't measure creativity. It didn't measure emotional intelligence. Furthermore, our cultural understanding of these tests means we give these scores undue weight. We tend to think of IQ scores as a fixed reflection of our intelligence. But this isn't the case. The IQ test actually measures current academic abilities or capabilities. It's the same. Not in it intelligence. Not the intelligence that you're born with. 
To this day, IQ tests just don't measure creativity. Still, to this day, IQ tests still don't measure creativity or practical intelligence, which you can think of as a street as street smarts. And they certainly don't measure emotional intelligence, all three of which are increasingly more important in the workplace and in life. The important distinction here, the important difference here is to remember the difference between test scores and your ability to learn. So we need to learn the distinction between test score and your ability to learn. Some people are smart, but they don't like exams. They don't like tests. They don't do very well in tests. But that does not mean they are not smart, you know? which are relatively stable, not to our intelligence levels, which are constantly increasing. Says Ryan Roach, not Roach, come on. Ryan Roosh of the National University of Ireland. David Schenk furthers this idea in his book. The Genius in All of Us. I think I've heard this book, The Genius in All of Us. He writes that everyone has the potential of uh, he writes that everyone ha- has the potential for genius or at the very least for greatness. But the reason we prefer to believe that we're either a genius or we're not or that we're either talented or not is because it relieves us from the responsibility of taking control of our own life. Yeah, a lot of times we, maybe you don't think so, but a lot of times you don't want to go after your dreams or you don't want to achieve your goals or or change your life for the better is because you don't want all that responsibility of taking control of your life or being responsible for your entire life. You just want like an easier path or someone else taking care of you. A belief in inborn gifts and, and limits is much gentler on the psyche. The reason you aren't a great opera singer is because you can't be one. That's simply the way you are wired. Thinking of talent as in it makes our world more manageable, more comfortable. It relieves a person of the burden of expectation. Your intelligence is not only malleable, but dependent on your ability to cultivate a growth mindset. Start looking at your attitude. Start looking at your attitude. Psyche. Psyche means uh, your emotions, your emotions and your psychological state. That's what it means, your psyche. mentality, you know, like your, your psychology. So listen to the way you talk. A fixed mindset usually shows up in your language. Maybe you say to yourself, I'm not good at reading. I'm not good at learning English. I am not good at achieving my goals. I'm just not that type of person right? That is fixed mindset. This kind of statement implies that you believe this is a fixed situation and your skills can't be improved. Instead, try saying something else. This is something I am not good at yet. This word is very powerful. I hope everybody knows the meaning of this word yet. Imagine adding that to every false belief you have about yourself. I don't look strong or I am not a strong person physically yet. Once I start going to the gym, that's going to change.
I don't have enough money yet. You see, that will change your whole belief system. This shift in language can be applied to anything you want to improve. This shift in language can be applied to anything you want to improve. This shift in language can be applied to anything you want to improve. Your test does not determine your future. They don't determine that you're capable of learning or and accomplishing. Take your education into your own hands. Here's the truth. It's not how smart you are. It's how you are smart. You see the shift? It's not about how smart you are. It's how you are smart, what you're smart at. There are multiple types of intelligence. Like so many things, intelligence is a combination of attitudes and actions and is dependent on context. New belief. Intelligence is fluid. Intelligence is fluid, like water. Lie number two, we only use 10% of our brains. We've all heard this myth. Some of us heard it for the first time in a classroom or some of us heard it from a friend. Some of us heard it through the media, maybe a documentary, a TV show or a movie. This myth is usually used in the context of highlighting launched for possibilities. Longed for possibilities, not launched. Longing for possibilities. So this myth is usually used in the context of highlighting longed for possibilities. If only we could access the rest of our brains, what could we accomplish? The story has been traced to a number of different sources. But as so often happens in the shaping of public opinion, it's likely built on by successive events. Some attribute it to author and philosopher William James, who wrote The Energies of Man, that we are making use of only a small part of our possible mental and physical resources. It could have originated with the work of Pierre Florence, a French physicist famous for his discoveries in the late 1800s about how the brain and the nervous system work and work together. The myth could also be related to the work of Dr. Carl Lashley in the 1920s, when Lashley removed parts of rat's cerebral cortex, the part of the brain, uh, responsible for higher order cognitive processing, basically the part of the brain that's responsible for language learning. He found, or language learning or like information, processing information, basically. He found the rats could still relearn some tasks. This led him to hypothesize incorrectly that whole parts of the brain were not necessarily being used. Some blame the earliest neural images of, uh, from PET and fMRI scans, which showed bright blotches on a screen with simplified explanations like, this is what your brain does when you pick something up. These images typically showed just one portion of the brain lighting up, leading the lay person to include that we only use a small portion of our brains at one time. This assumption, this belief, has also been perpetuated in countless ads and movies over the last hundred years. The adoption of the book, The Dark Fields, which was produced as Limitless in 2011, says we use 20% of our brain function. The 2014 movie, Lucy claimed we use 10% at any given time. In 2017, an episode of Black Mirror, a show, guys, this show, Black Mirror, I swear to God, this freaks me out. This freaks me out. I feel like very soon we're going to be living in a Black Mirror episode. 
But if you haven't seen it, it's pretty dark. A show known for its research and well thought through use of facts and statistics touted the myth, saying, even on a good day, we only use 40% of our brain capacity. All of these storylines were focused on the idea of unlocking our great, our greatest, albeit hidden potential. Needless to say, this myth is pervasive. It's everywhere. And yet, it's not true. In a succinct NPR segment, in a short NPR segment, the host plays a clip of Morgan Freeman posing in his dramatic bass voice. The what if scenario upon which Lucy is based. What if there was a way of accessing 100% of our brain? What might we be capable of? Is my voice similar to Morgan Freeman? I'm going to say it again and I'm going to try to saying it the way he says it. What if there was a way of accessing 100% of our brain? What might we be capable of? This was terrible. Neurologist David Eagleman gives a pointed response. We would be capable of exactly what we're doing now, which is to say, we do use a hundred percent of our brain. Countless evidence backs this up. Too much of it is uh, too much of it to include at all here. But Barry Bayerstein, a professor of psychology at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, in Canada, described some of the major scientific discoveries that refute this myth. Refute, this is a good word. Refute means reject this false belief, something that's not true, which I've paraphrased here. Studies of damaged brains show that there is no single area of the brain that can sustain damage without a loss of ability. Contrary to earlier theories, brain scans have shown that all brain areas are active, no matter what the activity even while we sleep all parts of the brain of our all parts of our brains show activity our brains are energy hogs the brain takes up only 2% of space by weight and yet accounts for 20% of energy consumption more than any other organ we wouldn't need such an incredible amount of energy for an organ that functioned at 40% or less. Scientists have also determined that the brain's regions have distinct functions that work together. After extensively mapping the brain over decades, they have concluded that there are no functionless areas of the brain. The meaning of energy hogs. Actually, I don't know. What is the meaning of energy hogs? Something that just, it takes so much energy. It, it takes up a lot of energy. All right. Thank you. Uh, who was that? Sherry, thank you for explaining that. So energy hog is something that takes up a lot of energy. Because it, it, is, it is true. 20% of our whole energy is consumed by the brain. Finally, as we've learned, the brain uses a process called synaptic pruning. If we didn't use a large portion of our brains, we would expect to see large areas of degeneration. We don't unless brain diseases are present. Otherwise, we don't see like, you know, huge parts of the brain, like if it's not used, oh, this part is gone. No. To sum up, to conclude, 
to summarize. This myth just isn't true. In an interview with Scientific American neurologist Barry Gordon from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore, um, he said, what? He said, so wrong, it is almost laughable. It's a funny thing to believe that. Here's the truth. What I want you to take from this is that you have all the power of your brain available to you now. The utopia that each of these movies and uh, TV shows depicts is already possible for you. While we use all of our brain, some people use their brain better than others. Just as most people use 100% of their body, there are some bodies that are faster, stronger, more flexible, and more energized than others. The key is to learn how to use your brain as efficiently and effectively as you possibly can. And by the end of this book, you will have the tools to do so. So new belief, I am learning to use my whole brain in the best way possible. And I'm going to change my mindset from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. If you send me a message on Instagram, I will send you the PDF and audio file of this book. So if you go to my profile from TikTok, shoot me a message. My Instagram is there. Shoot me a message on Instagram and I will send you the link and a copy of this book.